You can see there is one person being taken off the bus and now taken to an ambulance. We can see, again, multiple firefighters on the scene trying to remove people from these buses. Today, the Department of Health has learned through one of their investigations that five individuals have already been confirmed as cases of local transmissions of Zika are connected to the Miami Beach area. This brings the total number of local transmissions to 36. This means that we believe we have a new area where local transmissions are occurring in Miami Beach. To date, we have two very small areas in Miami-Dade County where we believe local transmissions are occurring. After aggressive testing in the Wynwood area, we're able to clear three additional blocks of the northeastern area of Wynwood because we are seeing no evidence of active transmission. This is in addition to the 14 blocks we've already been able to clear in Wynwood. Following today's news, I'm asking the Center for Disease Control for the following. An additional 5,000 Zika antibody test kits. This will ensure we can quickly test people for the virus additional lab support personnel to help us expedite Zika testing, and additional 10,000 Zika prevention kits. These are essential for pregnant women. To the index and breaking developments tonight about the Zika virus here in the U.S. Concern this evening over what appears to be a new cluster of Zika cases emerging for the first time in Miami Beach, an area popular with tourists. Late reports cite Florida health officials tonight saying these new cases have very likely been spread by local mosquitoes.
we really want to bring this issue back into the forefront and to draw attention to the enormous scale of people who have died in Syrian prisons. And as in terms of this scale, we have documented more than 17,000 people who have died in Syrian government custody since 2011. That's nearly 300 deaths per month. So the scale that we're discussing is just staggering. And how was the report made and who did you interview to obtain these findings? We spent five months on the research for this report from December 2015 to May 2016. And this report is based on the firsthand testimonies of 65 survivors of Syrian detention centers. People have been through this harrowing journey from arrest to interrogation to transfer, more interrogation and unending torture and horrendous uh, conditions. And for this uh, research, we conducted almost all of the interviews in person in Turkey, and then a few virtually in uh, the US, Europe, and Lebanon. And we also based these findings on nearly five years of research that we've conducted into conditions after 2011 in Syria, as well as on, one, on thousands of reports that the UN Commission of Inquiry and others have, have uh, investigated. And we have our findings are matching the patterns that they have seen, but we are able now to put together more evidence and more details on how exactly the journey of the detainee uh, is, is, is taken. Lots of attention being drawn to the plight of Syrian children after the publication of those images of Umran Daknish, but on this World Humanitarian Day, can we really expect anything to change? And what's it like working as a humanitarian on the front lines of a desperate conflict like the Syrian war? Well, to find out, I'm joined on the line from Chicago by Dr. Zahir Sahlul, a critical care physician and founder of the American Relief Coalition for Syria. Thank you so much, Dr. Sahlul, for speaking to France 24 this afternoon. Now, you volunteered in Aleppo and testified about the situation there to the UN. Could you just describe your experiences, specifically treating children in Syria? Thank you for having me. And uh, I just came in from Aleppo a few weeks ago, right before the siege uh, became a reality. Uh, and at that time, Aleppo was semi-sieged. And I worked in a hospital that is underground uh, for protection. Uh, it's the same hospital that treated Omran. And uh, I worked with the same physicians who took care of him and the nurses who took care of him. Uh, this is called M10 Hospital. It was bombed 17 times in the past four years by the Syrian regime with barrel bombing, and that's why it's underground. I visited seven hospitals in my last mission, and all of them have been bombed uh, several times. I took care of several children in this last mission. One of them is Ahmad, um, who was also five years old, similar to the age of Amran. And uh, he had a barrel bomb, and he had a shrapnel in his chest, and also part of the shrapnel cut into his spinal cord. And when I saw him in the intensive care unit, he was breathing really hard. So we had to put him on life support. We put the breathing tube into his mouth. And uh, he was between life and death when I saw him. Uh, normally, these type of situations are evacuated to a more developed hospitals or to Turkey. But because the, the road was very dangerous and it was bombed every day by the Syrian regime, we were not able to uh, transport him to Turkey. And uh, unfortunately, one day after I left, he died. He had cardiac arrest. He was not that lucky as, as Amran. I took care of uh, Fatima, who was 12 years old. Uh, she had this ability to start with. She was mute and deaf. And she had a barrel bomb. She had bleeding into her brain. And the only neurosurgeon in the city of Aleppo was able to put a draining tube into her um, head uh, to drain the blood. And she made it. Uh, she survived it. But I'm sure that she's traumatized forever because of the situation. I mean, there are too many children that I took care of. Uh, there was this child, which I still remember. I took his picture in the emergency room. Uh, he was with his two, with his uh, brother and sister. His brother, Abdul, is nine, and his sister, Elaf, were three. And their mom were at home. And then two barrel bombs fell on their home. Uh, and uh, his mom ha had internal bleeding. She ended up on life support. She was pregnant in her third month. Her fetus was dead. His older, bro his older brother, uh, Abdu, uh, was killed, and his younger sister, Ilaf, uh, three years old, were killed, and he survived. Uh, I, I, I tried to talk with him and joke with him. He was not able to smile. Uh, and, you know, he was 
completely traumatized because of the situation. Dr. Sahlul, so, I mean, I'm, that's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to cut you off. I mean, these sounds like horrific uh, conditions and certainly very traumatizing experiences that are quite uh, commonplace. I mean, are you surprised that these uh, uh, one Im these images uh, of uh, Umran had such an impact worldwide when you're seeing this uh, on such a, a regular occasion? Uh, definitely, I'm shocked uh, that this picture and this video, although it's very effective, of course, I mean, this is a child that was not able to, to cry. Um, you know, I guess he represents the Syrian children that their, their tears, uh, you know, have dried in, in the past five years. Uh, they've cried enough, and right now there's no more tears. But I, I was shocked by the reaction. You know, this is something that we see every day, and uh, every day I receive from my colleagues pictures of children who are mutilated or killed or made it, uh, you know, like Omran. Um, but I think anything that can put a human face on the crisis in Syria, anything that can move people from just looking at these pictures to action, which is what is needed. Action meaning, meaning protecting these civilians, protecting these uh, children, protecting these hospitals. There's 85,000 children in the besieged city of Aleppo that needed to be protected from barrel bombing, from missiles attack. And we need to know that who is the culprit. And the culprit is the Assad regime and the Russians who are bombing these hospitals and children. And I think anything that can move people to action is good. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but I do appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to us uh, this afternoon. Dr. Uh, Zahir Sahlul, critical care physician uh, who has made many trips uh, to Syria in a humanitarian uh, capacity. Today, uh, after first denying it, Florida reported a new cluster of locally transmitted Zika virus infections, this one outside the one Miami neighborhood that had been called the Zika zone. Five people have been infected, apparently by mosquitoes, in Miami Beach. That brings the total of mosquito-borne infections in the area to 36. Zika can cause severe birth defects. Miami Beach gets nearly 8 million tourists a year, but today the CDC warned pregnant women to stay away from the two Zika zones. David Begno is there. We believe we have a new area where local transmissions are occurring in Miami Beach. The five new cases involve three men and two women. Two are still on Miami Beach. One is returned to El Paso, Texas, another to New York, and the third to Taiwan. Florida Governor Rick Scott has come under fire for waiting too long to inform the public about the newest Zika zone. CBS News confirmed this information yesterday, and your office told us all day and night that the reporting was wrong. It's very important that the information the state puts out is accurate and timely. All right. The Department of Health finished their investigation, concluded their investigation this morning. There have been officials who have told us that there's a suspicion that your office is trying to downplay the Zika threat. I want to make sure everybody in our state and everybody that's going to come here, you know exactly what's going on. It's very important. Joseph First is chairman of the Wynwood Business Improvement District. Wynwood was the first Zika zone. What grade would you give Florida's governor on how he's handled this crisis so far? Um, it, to me, it, it's C minus at best, and then I think approaching a failure. South Beach, its most popular destination in these parts, lies right in the heart of the New Zika zone. Mike Palma is vice president of hospitality at the iconic Clevelander Hotel. Buy bug spray and do things that are going to make it seem and deem safe. You've got nearly naked people walking around here in bathing suits. What do you do with them? Yeah, I, I can't, I don't know, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to offer it. I'm going to have it available if people want it. But look, at people, again, they come here to relax and plug and enjoy it. I don't think they're too worried about Zika at this point. Convincing tourists to wear long sleeves and pants is advised by the CDC as a tough sell. Mercedes Cabrera, who's pregnant, lives in the Wynwood Zika zone. She's spending um, most of her days you know, mentally, indoors. It's, uh, the Zika, it's, it's going through my mind 24-7. It's like, okay, do I go outside? Did I put my spray? You have to be prepared. This morning, even before the governor confirmed the cases here on Miami Beach, crews were starting to spray against mosquitoes in this very area. Scott, the governor says he's been asking the federal government for more test kits, but they haven't come, though the CDC director says tonight more are coming, as many as 5,000 of them, and they will arrive on Tuesday. David Begno reporting, thanks. Today, fire officials said at least 96 homes were destroyed in the intense wildfires this week in San Bernardino County. Carter Evans is there.
There is a lot of rubble like this to go through and over a wide area. 37,000 acres went up in flames and now firefighters believe the number of destroyed homes may rise. The damage assessment teams are out in force today meticulously documenting the destruction. Cadaver dogs have also been searching homes for anyone who may not have escaped the fast moving flames. An 80 foot wall of fire that roared through several desert communities. So far there are no reported deaths. Meanwhile, firefighters are going back through burned out communities to douse any remaining hot spots before evacuees are allowed to return. This afternoon, some of the evacuation orders have been lifted and Scott, that's when many people will return to see if their homes are still standing. Carter Evans. Thanks. In the city of Elizig, a police station in ruins. Nearby vehicles turned to charred wrecks. The bomb left a large crater in the side of the building and plumes of smoke were seen far into the distance. Authorities had initially pinned the blame on PKK militants. But President Erdogan later suggested that exiled Islamic cleric Fethullah Gulen could be behind the attack. I see these attacks as reprisals against the 20 days of democracy vigils. There's no difference between Fethullah Gulen's organization, the PKK and the Islamic State group. These attacks once again show that they all serve the same goal. My people should be reassured. The blood of our martyrs and wounded has been and will be avenged. Turkey has again demanded Gulen's extradition from the United States. They allege that he is responsible for last month's failed coup. Also on Thursday, a roadside bomb targeted a military vehicle in the nearby city of Bitlis. It's been a violent 24 hours in Turkey's southeast. Late Wednesday night, a police station was targeted when two car bombs went off in van. Dozens of people, including around 20 police officers, were wounded in that attack. Clashes between the PKK and Turkish security forces have picked up since last July, when a two and a half year fragile ceasefire between the two sides collapsed.